stand together for the reading of God's Word, open your Bible to the book Jeremiah, find chapter number 31. Jeremiah 31. The message this morning is on the subject and the issue of abortion. I want to talk about the second abolition. The second abolition is the name of the message. You want to record that and, and use it in all of our stuff that we do, okay? Jeremiah chapter 31, we're looking at uh, verse, I'm sorry, did I say chapter 31? That's the verse I want. That's not the chapter. Chapter 7. Chapter 7, verse 31. Chapter 7, verse 31. And while you're finding that, I'm going to take off my jacket. Is that okay with everybody? I like to, I have respect for our church. If you don't want me to preach in my shirt sleeves, just good. Uh, I also know you well enough to know it's not a problem, but anyway, you never know. And somebody's going to get a little uncomfortable, right? Okay, Jeremiah 7, verse number 31, the Bible says, And they have built the high places of Tophet, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I commanded them not, neither came it into my heart. Father, how has it come into ours? Help us, Lord, sacrificing the children. I pray, Father, that you will help me to preach with clarity and to deliver fully, Lord God, the burden of your heart to ours on this important subject. In Jesus' name I pray for that. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The second abolition, the first was to abolish the wicked and unholy and ungodly practice of slavery. The thought of somebody owning another person is truly reprehensible. Particularly when you add to it some of the treatment that they put upon those that they pretended in their own silly and vain mind to own. Now we have another situation that's very similar in so many ways. A lot of people believe that the so-called product of conception is the property of the mother to do with as she pleases. But that's not true, and I hope to bring that out uh, with clarity from the Scripture this morning. And let me also offer the context in which I'm preaching this message. We are about to launch a new ministry at Lighthouse Baptist Church. I'm excited about it. I have for a long time thought of it and prayed about it and so on, but the, the things have come together in such a way that uh, that single to me, and after I prayed, I felt confirmation in this that we should move forward and establish a ministry like that for Lighthouse Baptist Church. I didn't even know that we had a Planned Parenthood in this community. I'm sorry, I just didn't know. I haven't had much occasion to need one. That isn't a sufficient excuse, but I, I just didn't know. In fact, I assumed we didn't have one. I never heard anything about it, but anyway, we do. It's a, it's a baby killing center right here in our city, and we need to we need to step into that area of darkness in our community and shine some light. So that's what we're going to do. And this message kind of sets up that ministry. And I'm going to introduce at the end of the service today, Mike and Alicia, who are going to help us with that ministry. Uh, we've talked a lot about it. We've been discussing this. We've got the little booklet out there. He, he gave that to me. I looked it over. I read it. I approved of it. Just so you know, you know, we're not just grabbing some book somewhere and putting it out there. I looked it over very carefully, and um, I like it. And I think it's very going to be very helpful to us. He'll be teaching a class to all of us. I'll be in that class. And uh, giving us some insight that he's picked up along the way, biblical insight and experiential insight, and insight he's gathered from others as well. And he's going to help us prepare ourselves to be a witness on the sidewalks there at the Planned Parenthood and give us some insight in all of that. Let me say this much right now that I found to be extremely encouraging. I mean, I was willing to go ahead and do this anyway, uh, but when I learned this, I thought, wow, that is so awesome. Some of you know about the uh, woman that left Planned Parenthood. She spoke at the RNC convention here lately, 
You, you know who I'm talking, because I can't remember her name. If somebody, say again. Abby Johnson. Abby Johnson. There you go. Thank you. So Abby Johnson's got quite a story. I, I watched the, the movie they put together telling her story and done a little bit of reading uh, about her story. It's remarkable how God brought her out of that and is using her as such a champion for life right now. In any event, um, in her story, she comes out of Planned Parenthood and now has established a ministry to call people who work in that business out of it. I can't remember the number. Hundreds of people have been helped to transition out of that industry and into uh, some, some labor where they can feel good about what they're doing <laughs> and not have to feel like they're participating in the murder of a child. In any event, um, I learned from something she said that when protesters are standing out in, in front of a clinic, it reduces their business sometimes up to 75% on those days. And that's a dirty little secret that the Planned Parenthood industry, the abortion industry generally, does not want you to know. Just standing there. So they have their, their appointment book all set up. And when the protesters show up, they go, oh, no. There goes about 75%, up to 75% of our, of our booked appointments for today. So get ready to start calling those that don't show up and try to reschedule. Why? Well, what, what happens is people who have scheduled an abortion, you know, there is such a thing as a conscience that's remaining, at least in some measure, sometimes little, sometimes faint, but it's there. And when you stand there with a sign that says something like babies are killed here or babies are murdered here, or something like that. It doesn't have to be graphic and gross, but it, it can be poignant and clear. When, when people coming there for an abortion see a sign like that, or they see people out there protesting, they just keep driving. It's enough all by itself to cause them to rethink what it is that they've decided to do. I hear stories regularly from my friend uh, down south, our friend Max Graves, Pastor Graves at Liberty Baptist Church, who has a very active ministry in this way. Uh, in his city, Norwalk and Downey and the surrounding areas. And uh, I, I, I get their Facebook live stream pictures of what's going on there and all that kind of stuff. And not too long ago, they talked about, uh, I think on one day, they saved three babies. Mothers who came to abort a child, but in conversation with their, uh, their team there, made, made a decision not to do it. So it's an effective ministry. Even if all you do is stand there with a sign, if you don't have the boldness to actually approach somebody and speak to them, your presence there is meaningful. And I think it's meaningful to God too. All right, I think it is. So let's go ahead and get into the message. Our text, they have built the high places of Tophet. What in the world is a Tophet? Well, it's a noun that actually identifies a place which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Who's that? And what are they there, there to do? They are there to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire. And it's an offering to a god they called Moloch. Tophet was a place where the heathen cremated their dead. Now, particular interest to us in this message is the fact that Tophet is located in what's called the Valley of Hinnom, or the Valley of the Son of Hinnom. And according to Joshua 15, verse 8, this valley is ascribed to the Jebusites. And it's associated with Jerusalem. It's right there on the border of Jerusalem. It was part of Jerusalem at one time. So somebody's got to be asking themselves, so what does that have to do with the price of petunias in North Africa? In what way is that possibly relevant to anything you're saying or to us sitting here in that heat, in this heat? Well, Here's what's interesting about it. Joshua 15, verse 8 tells us, as I pointed out, the border went up by the valley of the son of Hinnom unto the south side of the Jebusite. The same is Jerusalem, and the border went up to the top of the mountain that lieth before the valley of Hinnom westward, and so on. The Jebusites are of the Amorites, and you're still waiting for the point, but it's about to come. The Amorites held the kingdom under God in the days of Melchizedek. 
Now, this church has been instructed in these matters, but for the few who might be kind of new to us, let me give you a brief uh, update on that. There's this thing called the kingdom of man. God gave to the kingdom of man the dominion and the sword. The dominion is stewardship over the resources of the earth, minerals, so on, fish, air, uh, you know, all this stuff. And then the sword refers to that sword God gives to government for the purpose of executing wrath upon evildoers. He gave the kingdom to mankind, but because man sinned, and in Nimrod, God divided them up, God decided from there forward to give the, the kingdom to which nation he would choose. So it would move from one to another. At the time of Melchizedek, Melchizedek, at the time of Melchizedek, he had it. He was God's king priest. And guess where he lived? Jerusalem. It was called Salem then. It came to be called Jerusalem later. But at that time it was Salem and Melchizedek was its king. And he was the king of Salem, Jerusalem, and the priest of the Most High God, and he was an Amorite. Now, why is that significant? Here's why. In Genesis chapter 15, 16, actually in Genesis 14, you know, God, I can go back earlier, Genesis 12 <laughs> and 13, God promised to Abraham the kingdom. The Amorites at that time held it. And God promised to take it from the Amorites and give it to Israel the seed of Abraham. In Genesis 14, God has Abraham sit down with Melchizedek and they have kind of like a communion supper. It's a real weird, bizarre New Testament moment in the Old Testament. And there are several of those. But anyway, they have this little tete-a-tete. -tete. I'm not sure what they talked about. We're not told but what we do know is that after that meeting in Genesis 15, God comes to Abraham, reconfirms his promise to give the land of Canaan, which was the land of Melchizedek, to give that to Abraham. But he said it won't happen until the iniquity of the Amorites has come to the full. That tells us that God would not transfer the land, the promised land, to his people, the people of Israel, until after the Amorites had corrupted themselves to the place where God would then take it from them and give it to another nation. And that pattern continues throughout history. It's dramatically illustrated in the book of Daniel, where God takes, gives the kingdom to a nation, takes it from them, gives it to the other, and so on. This is what God does with the kingdom. The Amorites had it. God said he would not take it from the Amorites until their sins had come to the full. Well, by the time Israel came into the land, the Amorites had begun practicing the murder of children and sacrifice to a God they named Moloch. 2 Kings 23, verse 10, And he defiled Topheth, which is in the valley of the children of Hinnom, that no man might make his son or his daughter to pass through the fire to Moloch. Now that was in the days of Josiah, who was the last king of Judah, the last king to hold the kingdom of Israel. Judah was the last king in a succession of kings in Judah that held the kingdom. What he did in the reforms that he implemented was to go in and tear down Tophet in the valley of Hinnom where they would, where they would sacrifice their children in the fires to Moloch. Well, when did it begin to happen in Israel that God's people would do this horrible thing. Understand that at the time that God transferred the kingdom from the Amorites to Israel, they had come to the place where they were bringing their, their newborn babies, their sons and their daughters, to a priest of Moloch. 
and turning their baby over to this priest, and that priest would do some kind of weird ritual and then cast that baby into the fires of Moloch to burn alive. It's horrible. It was at that time in history that God said, we've had enough. The iniquity of the Amorites is full. And he sent Israel in to conquer the land. And God took the land from the Amorites and turned it over to the Israelites. But it wasn't too long along the way when the kings of Israel began to practice this wicked business. A king named Ahaz, 2 Chronicles 28, verse 3, moreover, the, moreover, I'm sorry, he burnt incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire after the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. It's all right there. I mean, I don't know how more clear it could be. God is saying this is the reason they lost the kingdom. And now you're doing the very same thing that they were doing. And then after Ahaz comes Manasseh, who was yet even more evil. And by the way, all of these kings come toward the end of the line of Judah. Ahaz, anyway, I, I want to get uh, tied down into the history of all that. It's, it's really interesting, but I don't want to take time to do that. Suffice it to say, Israel didn't last very long. Pretty soon, God took them under Sennacherib and wiped them out and spread them out all over the earth. And now we come to Manasseh, who was the grandfather of Josiah, interestingly enough. Manasseh was even more evil. In 2 Chronicles 33, 6, And he caused his children to pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. Also, he observed times and used enchantments and used witchcraft and dealt with a familiar spirit and with wizards. He wrought much evil in the sight of the Lord and provoked him to anger. And it is interesting that right along with this business of, of accepting abortion in our country, there has been a huge uh, increase of interest in the occult. Oh, it's always been here, of course. There have always been some people out there playing around and dabbling with this sort of thing, but it has really just become accepted commonly throughout our culture now. And they do go hand in hand. This is the ultimate sacrifice to Satan. In the days of Josiah, who was the last king of Judah, he instituted some reforms. And there's little doubt in my mind that God tolerated or waited to drop his judgment upon Judah because he saw Josiah coming. And God is that way. He'll always give mercy where he can find an excuse to do it. It's just the way he is. And so rather than drop that judgment upon Manasseh, and by the way, also it should be noted that Manasseh in the latter years of his life repented and got right with God. Now his son, Ammon, didn't catch the fire of that revival and went on in his father's wickedness and evil. But his son, Josiah, did pick it up. He modeled his life after the last days of his grandfather. Whereas Josiah's own father modeled his life after the earlier example of Manasseh. And just to help you see how parallel these two things really are. The, the issue of taking babies and burning them in the fire to Moloch and the issue of abortion. One of the I don't know why I want to say favorite, but one of the standard staple methods of killing these babies is the infusion of something called a saline solution, which literally burns them to death in their mother's womb. In the 60s, America shifted spiritual center to, to a position being, of being spiritually at the center and then left. 
That began in the 60s. And that's when Americans began to be much more comfortable, not as comfortable as they are today with it, but then it was a real stark contrast because up till then, Americans would not even think of putting anybody in the office of presidency who wasn't a Christian. If some guy was an atheist and was known to be an atheist, there's no way he would ever be elected to the office of president or perhaps really to any office in America for a long, long time. In fact, there's still a kind of basic resistance to that in our culture, even today. We need to wake that up in a big way. Now, that's part of what my book tries to do. It tries to help Christians understand why it's important that we put godly people, Christian people, into office. But this began to move or to develop with some strength. It began to get traction, let's say, in the 60s. And by the time we come into 1973, we'd put enough wicked people into positions of power like those wicked jurists on the Supreme Court at that time in our history. We had evil men. Men who did not believe the Bible was the Word of God. Men who did not understand morality within the context of Scripture or the Bible. But they thought of morality as a kind of social contract. Their idea of morality is, well, whatever is supportable in the consensus of the people. That's a major shift before, you go back and read all these cases, I've read many, many, and probably well over 100 or more of cases in the Supreme Court, in the history of the Supreme Court, where you have all these references to the Bible, to our Christian heritage, even statements like America is a, is a Christian nation founded upon the Bible. This kind of language is all over the place in our early legal documents, you know, in the courts. That begins to change over time, and by the time we come to this court, the court that ruled in that infamous Roe v. Wade decision that made abortion legal, that court had come to a place where it no longer looked to the Bible as instructing them or informing them in matters of morality. What they looked to instead was reason, and their sense of morality was instructed by what society would accept, what society believed, a kind of social engineered morality. And when judges began making decisions based on societal norms and no longer being guided by the scripture, then we began to go downhill fast. <clears throat> and that's what we're dealing with right now in this country. A group of people who believe that right and wrong is determined by society, not determined by the Bible or a higher authority, God, which is His will revealed to us through the Bible. So in 1973, a wicked Supreme Court ruled abortion was legal, unless the legislature would come along and rule on the question, when does life begin? In other words, these judges, they were saying that the legislature needs to pass a law that defines life as beginning at conception or beginning wherever it decides it begins. But until the legislature passes a law that defines when life begins then we see no reason to say that you can't kill the so-called product of conception. You follow with this? You see what I mean? This is what they were thinking. Because they decided that a Congress makes decisions about when life begins. Well, guess where that has taken us? This idea that a legislative body determines questions like when does life begin? Social consensus for definitions like life led us into a, a place where now 
We can't even define marriage anymore. We can't, we can't define anything, it seems like. I mean, we, we, we've lost our ability to give any kind of meaningful definition to liberty. We've lost our ability to give any kind of really meaningful definition to justice. We can't even figure out gender anymore. It's gotten to be totally ridiculous. And it started when they decided a legislative body. That's how we know when life begins or doesn't. Now let me just take one moment to say something here. You realize that's been true from the very beginning. At the time that decision came down, it was said, it was articulated in those who wrote with regard to the decision, the ones who made the decision, they said that if the Congress, both houses, and with the president signing on, passed a law that said life begins here or here or here, then this would no longer be legal. Do you understand that these wicked congressmen and women have even more blood on their hands than that wicked court does? Wait a minute, are you listening to what I'm saying? I'm telling you, every lousy president and every lousy Congress and every lousy Senate, we've a House of Representatives and lousy Senate that we've had since 1973 has ignored the fact that all they had to do was make a law that said life begins here and this would have been over. They have hid behind the court did it. Well, you know the court did it. Well, you know that court did it. And that's what those lousy, good-for-nothing, wicked, dark-hearted people have done all these years. They've hid behind, they've hid behind the skirts of the jurists. And we're not brave enough to step forward. Now, they tried a couple of times lately. It should have been done right away. If it had been done right away, this would have been shut down across America because Americans were not happy about this. This was not something done in the legislative body by people who were responsible to voters. And most Americans did not support abortion. If our Congress in 1973 had said, what? And stepped forward and championed a bill that would define when life begins scientifically, if they couldn't get the Bible in, into their hands, into their heads, they could at least be honest about what the science says. But by then, we've also, we also lost science. Science had long before that decided we all came out of a polywog. But I tell you what, one thing that's really bothered me about this issue all these years is how legislative body after another has hidden behind the skirts of the Supreme Court. Well, I've called them out on it many, many, many times over the years, and I'm calling them out on it again today. Those, those Congress people are every bit as much guilty for the blood of, what is it, 50 or 60 million babies now? Is it 60 or 50? It's over 60 now. Oh, my soul. Over 60 million babies. And one show I did a while back on the Ramosaw show, I tried to calculate the amount of blood that would be. And at that time, I think it was 53 million. It was pretty much enough blood to cover most of America by some calculations. It would certainly cover all of the Capitol buildings in every state in the country. It would certainly flood the Supreme Court. It would certainly flood and cover the entire Capitol Dome and the White House. All of, Was all of Washington would be a foot deep in the blood of those babies. It's a wicked business. 
<coughs> well, anyway, Tophet today would be Planned Parenthood or any other abortion clinic or any other place where they commit this atrocity. The dirty little secret behind the whole abortion industry is how much the occult is interested in it. Well, you can see from the scriptures that we've read that there is a very close connection between worshiping Satan and killing babies. So why is abortion wrong? I probably don't need to spend a lot of time on this point in front of this particular audience, but let's take a look at it and remind ourselves, why is this wrong? Psalm 127.3, Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of of the womb is his reward. With anyone that has natural affection in place, and the Bible does talk about unnatural affection, by the way. There's natural affection and unnatural affection. Anyone whose affection has not been perverted in this culture has no trouble at all understanding that it's a bad idea to kill a baby at any point in its development. But persons who've had their affections perverted in this perverse culture, they, well, I don't know. Maybe you could kill the baby here or here or here or here. Those with hardened hearts whose natural affection has been perverted harden their hearts against their own children. The Bible speaks of that in Isaiah 49, 15. Can a woman forget her suckling child or her sucking child that she should not have compassion on the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, yet I, they, yet will I not forget thee, the Bible says. Think about that, Isaiah 49, 15. I mean, God raises the question, can a woman forget her sucking child? You ever seen a picture, a sonogram of a baby sucking its thumb in the womb? God says, I will not forget. So what about the issue of hardships exacerbated by a pregnancy you weren't anticipating and you're not prepared for? What about a situation like that? Well, God knows how to provide for us. We don't have to commit murder because we're concerned about something like that. God can provide. But you see, God isn't part of any of that, is it? Is he? God isn't a part. Of, that's why we go to the Planned Parenthood and put up our signs and put our presence there because we want to bring God to their mind. They need to think about what they're doing. From the perspective of God is watching, God sees this, here's what God thinks about it. The Bible says God will step in when a baby is forsaken by its parents. Psalm 27, 10, when my father and my mother forsake me, then the Lord will take me up. These babies have someone who cares for them. These babies have somebody who's interested in them. According to Psalm 139, these babies are being fashioned in the womb of their mothers by the hand of God. That's what the Bible says. Adoption is a better option than murder. You know that Jesus was adopted by Joseph? Jesus was an adopted child. Just thought I'd throw that out there. What about the case of adultery or fornication? How can the fruit of the womb be God's reward in a case of adultery or fornication? David always comes up in this discussion. And he actually does kind of show both sides of this thing. In the first place, his sin was found out because of a conception. And then God took that baby to heaven. So God used that whole scenario to both discover a sin and to judge a sin. Someone says, what about that poor baby? Poor? That baby's richer than anybody here. That baby's with Jesus. And we understand that. That's often thrown into our face. These people say, well, the baby's going to go to heaven, right? Yeah, but when you get there after him, you're going to have to face that baby. And then what? Worse than that, you're going to face Jesus who was in the process of forming that baby when you allowed the, the invasion to come into that womb, that sacred and 
sanctified place and kill that baby. Now, some of you might think you're being pretty hard on these women who've, who've uh, committed abortions. You know, one of the problems we've got in this whole debate is that the left has succeeded at getting us focused on the concerns and the plight of these mothers, and they're not alone in this. I don't know any mother except one that had a baby show up without some help. And even she had some help. The father put the seed in there and generated the birth of his son, Jesus Christ. Did it, with a, did it in a miraculous way. Praise the Lord. But there's not one woman who's ever had an abortion where there wasn't some man involved in the whole situation. Now, obviously, if the man involved in that situation protested the abortion, stood up against it, tried everything he could to stop it, and the woman went on with it anyway, then it's all on her. Now, I'm not here to try to adjudicate all of these different scenarios right now. We can't do that. We haven't got the time. But obviously, anybody with moral sense would understand that. I get it. But if you involved yourself in creating or starting the uh, development of a baby by violating one of God's rules and one of God's laws, you don't need to be committing adultery and fornication. But we don't kill the baby because of the situation. Now, in the case of David, God took the baby. And then later on, the same woman becomes David's wife after he killed her husband. This is a bad story. But God mercifully opened her womb and gave her the next king of Israel. Solomon. Same woman. So it shows God's mercy in all of this. God's willingness to redeem. And I've been around long enough and worked with enough women who've suffered through this to know how redeeming having the baby is. There's so much redemption in having the baby. And I'm using the redemption not in the theological sense of having our sins forgiven and all that. I mean redemption in the sense of bringing you on the other side of a very bad situation to a very good place. You see, people with natural affection, here's what happens. If they go through a situation where it's because of adultery or fornication, and then they end up with a baby that they weren't anticipating, the people with natural affection can't help it. They pick up that little baby and draw that little child to their chest, and they just fall in love if they're not already overwhelmed by the whole miracle of birth. There's healing in having the baby. I'm sure Bathsheba was greatly comforted and much healed in the birth of Solomon. And David too. The baby provides the best opportunity for healing if you have natural affection. If your affection is all perverted by this materialistic world and you're all focused on things and not what really matters, people, well then the baby's getting in the way of your things. And there's probably not one person in this room who does not agree with me. That is sick. That's just sick. That anybody would exalt things in life above the value of life itself. It's unreal. But there are many who get trapped and, and, and kind of drawn into that whole spirit. And they think that way. But God help us. What about the case of rape or incest? How can the fruit of the womb be God's reward in a case like that? You know, in the same, it, it, it might seem crazy to you, but if you think about it, I think you'll see what I'm, what I'm trying to point out. I have seen this. I've seen situations. I've met women who have suffered the horror of rape, who ended up with a child from that whole thing, and invariably they'll say, as weird as this sounds, I wouldn't give up the child even if it meant 
I would not have had to have the experience of being raped. There's healing in having the baby. There's healing in that. That's where the best healing will come from. And if there are circumstances in which there's no possible way they could care for the baby, adoption, as I've already mentioned, is a much preferred option. My intent in this message isn't to go through all of the uh, counseling situations, you know, stuff we might go through in a counseling situation. I, I can't do that for obvious reasons, I just, but I want to touch on it so you understand. What are you thinking, God? This guy raped me and you leave me with a baby? What are you thinking? And God says, please give your attention to the baby that I gave you. Put your attention on the baby that I gave you. Believe me when I say that baby is going to minister to your heart in amazing and wonderful ways. That baby is your healing. That baby is your comfort. All things work together for good, the Bible says. All things. That includes things like rape. All things work together for good. Anybody who would look at a baby that's the product of, they say, the product of rape or something like that. I don't believe babies are the product of, of rape. They're the product of God. They're the God's reward is the point of this point. But anybody that will look at a baby who was born in a situation like that and despise that baby is despising the reward of God. It was God's reward. You, and I know we don't understand it. Uh, when was the last time you came up upon, upon something that you couldn't quite get your head around when it comes to God? We don't understand a lot of things like this. But believe me when I tell you, when the Bible says that the baby in your womb is the, is the reward of God, that's what the Bible says, and that's always true. That's always true. That's true when you can't afford to have a baby. That's true when you've had adultery and you wind up with a baby. That's true when you've had fornication and you end up with a baby. That's true if you get raped and you have a baby. That's always true. It's God's reward. It's God's path toward healing and help and blessing in your bad situation. Every time. And to destroy that fruit of the womb is a slap in God's face. A rejection of the very thing that God gave you that would have been the good out of that bad situation. Amen? Psalm 139, 13 to 16. And then verse 17, For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, that my soul knoweth right well. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, when as yet there, were, there was none of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. <clears throat> now, this passage is often used to, to help us understand that God is the one that's shaping and active in the development of a baby in the womb. But this passage is even larger than that. It's just an amazing passage. It's, it's great because it means that when God grabbed up that dust of the earth and he formed Adam, Every single one of us. He was looking at every single one of us. Do you know that? Every single human being that would come out of that body was right there at that time. And when it says that he, in continuance, fashioned them, it means that over the time when this man and woman got together and had this baby who grew up to get with somebody to have that baby who grew up to get together to have somebody have that baby and that baby and that baby, God is tracking the coming out of a baby he saw at the time he created Adam. It's just amazing. Somebody says, you mean even in the case of rape or incest and all that kind of stuff? Yeah, you know, last time I checked my theology, God knows everything before it happens. So yeah, when he was creating Adam, he saw those babies too. He saw all of it. Those babies matter to God. Those babies are important to God. His thoughts are toward them. 
He had something in mind for them. But we're killing them. And of course, you know that one baby in a womb of a mother noticed or recognized the baby in the womb of another mother and waved in its own special way. Leaped. Got excited. Right? I'm talking about Elizabeth, John the Baptist, and in the womb of Mary was Jesus Christ. And John said, hey, there's the Lord. He did it through a certain language. It's called, you know how you have sign language? This is done with the feet. And he kicks on the womb and he jumps around, moves around. Of course, science tells us, real science that is, that from the moment of conception, you have a human being. That's the only thing it can be called. It can't be called anything else. It's a human being. Why Christians should speak up? Well, we have a moral responsibility to speak up for those who are ready to be slain. <clears throat> if thou forbear to deliver them that are drawn unto death, and those that are ready to be slain, if thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? And he that keepeth thy soul, doth not he know it? And shall not he render to every man according to his works? One reason we have got to speak up on behalf of these children, these babies, is because we're going to be held to account. I mean, it should be enough to motivate us what I've said already. These babies are valuable to God. They are His reward. They are His reward to humankind. They are His reward to the human race. Who knows how many wonderful inventions that would be helpful to our lives have been lost because we killed the person God was going to use to bring it to us. How do we know? How much of God's reward have we already despised and killed? That should be enough all by itself to motivate us to want to go out there and help with this cause. But consider this. If we don't stand up, step forward and speak up, we're going to be held accountable. We become among those who have perpetrated this evil in our land. If we don't do something about it, if we don't speak up, if we don't act to deliver, we are salt and we are light. And there's no place in our culture today where there's greater darkness and putrefaction than in this business of abortion. It calls for our light and it calls for our salt and we are the light and the salt it, that, that's needed here in this case. We are ambassadors for Christ. We're supposed to represent him on this earth. Does anyone here imagine he doesn't have something to say about this? Of course he does. How is he going to get it said? Through us. He gets it said through you and me. We're his ambassadors. We are soldiers. Commissioned to wrestle against these principalities, these dark powers that, that are operating behind all this wicked business. And we are literally the only people on the planet that can stand up to that darkness. We're it. There is no other. Only you, a Christian in whom is the Holy Spirit, has the power to stand up against this darkness. There's no one else that can do it. We have the only message that can save them. So I want to talk to you about what we can do. And I'm going to deal with that to, in the evening service. But right now, as we can, let's stand together, please.